All right, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about O'Brien crystal mouthpieces. In my first introduction to O'Brien mouthpieces, I bought one myself, I believe, in 1978. You know what it looks like right here? Metal cap on the end. And I believe I bought it from Herbert Koss Music Store, Royal Music and Royal Oak at the time. Because in 1978, I had bought a my first clarinet ever, which was a Norm D4. And it was hand selected by it was hand selected by Mr. Koff himself, because I was a frequent. I took music lessons at a store, frequent person at a store, and all that stuff. Because it's right down the road. Anyways, going on, I want to review some emails I had from the O'Brien family back in 2005 and 2008, I believe. We're gonna to get to that right now. I'm just gonna read them to you and not show them to you because there's a lot of other miscellaneous information in there. They actually contacted me looking to buy some. And one O'Brien family member, Harry O'Brien was his grandfather, and he had made, uh, and Harry O'Brien had made mouthpieces until he had a stroke in the early 1950s. Now, this person's father was Harry Jr., and he was ousted out of the family business in 1940. And then his uncle, which had an interesting story, it, he stated he ran the business into the ground. And he stated sometimes they would etch a date in the glass. Many times it's hard to make out what they said, though. The darker, maybe slight dark pink glass would show up in the older mouthpieces. And he actually had a lot of older scrap glass to compare to figure out the vintage of mouthpieces. In the early 40s, you would notice the newer ones were clearer and fewer bubbles. The mold, the mouthpiece mold, could also give away as they broke the older mold in, in the 50s and a new mold was made. The older ones had three grooves on each side, six total. The newer 60 ones on had one on each side. That's about all he knew about that. It says his family history is a little sordid one. His father continued to make the Selmer primer clarinet in the 40s, as his grandfather did not want to manufacture clarinets anymore. So they actually made clarinets too. And remember that. We should have a video about that. And apparently Pete Fountain used several of his mouthpieces of course and he met him of course in the shop once coming over to check mouthpieces out no one on his uncle's side played clarinet but on his side they all played clarinet his sister had a true o'brien clarinet and mouthpiece her clarinet was the last ones he did before his stroke <clears throat> here's another one um the uncle that i talked about his cousin took over from his uncle in the 80s and he only made a few just to pay bar tabs so he basically took the mouthpiece business and drained it to the ground, I guess, supposedly. And like you mentioned, this is uh, April, March 2006. Oh, this is interesting. The K. O'Brien Double Chamber Detroit, I believe these are saxophone mouthpieces, or rubber mouthpieces. This was the one from his cousin that made the mouthpieces. And that's about the gist of all the emails I have from the family members there. Actually, I had another, I have other emails from Kyle O'Brien, too. The great-grandson of Harry O'Brien. And he was just looking to buy some mouthpieces. He gave me his personal email address. I emailed him there and replied to this one, too, and never got a reply. Anyways, that's some inside history of the O'Brien family in mouthpiece making. Now, I mentioned another video. One of my favorite mouthpieces is an O'Brien one, which is this one. This one is slightly longer. Than the other ones and the window is slightly not as wide which allows the beak to be a little bit longer so that's really interesting this is one of my favorite mouthpieces to play though i don't play much i don't want to break it i actually have a second one of these type of mouthpieces that's slightly longer but there's a little chip on the end I'm, one of these days i'll fix it i've had it for 15 years or something but for instance this o'brien has three grooves on either side no etching on the top and etchings on the bottom. I can't read it with my eyesight anymore. Here's another one. <clears throat> Three grooves on either side. Etching on the bottom, not the top. This one I mentioned is one of my favorite ones. Is a etched on the top. I don't know if you can see it or not. There's H. Selmer on it. So this is a Selmer branded O'Brien mouthpiece. There, I believe there's no etching on the table. 
There's actually no facing information on this mouthpiece at all, so I don't know what the facing is. I shouldn't. I probably measured it one time, but I forgot what it was. But it's a really nice mouthpiece. It's one of my favorites of all times. And the second one, which is same length, has O'Brien etched on the top. But let's get to my website and read what I have on there about it. Anyways, at the top here, I have some O'Brien information, basically a summary of what I mentioned from the emails about the different mouthpieces, how Pete Fountain used his clarinets and mouthpieces early on. Identifications, we have number one, very short close, two medium French. Uh, the star is one millimeter, very popular. Two stars, more open than the off-center bore. Oh, when you see OCB, that stands for off-center bore. I don't really know what it means by off-center bore because the bore is centered. <laughs> so go figure that. Uh, two stars, more open than the OB star. Number three at 1.16 millimeters. Uh, number four is 1.19, so I assume three stars in between that. Number five is 1.25 millimeters. 1.25 millimeters and the five star is the most open one now this is tony scott in an advertisement showing vintage 1970s o'brien crystal clarinet mouthpieces so here's a few measurements of some o'brien's i've had in the past which are basically fives and one had a 0.047 opening one had a 0.44 one had a 0.054 and 0.043 and the face and length varied so I guess you had to try them to find out if you found one that you liked. Um, of course, these are probably different generations, too, that I owned. Continuing on, we have a Salmer Clarion one, a very early model O'Brien mouthpiece. This was reviewed on my Salmer Paris mouthpieces. You can see how you can't really see through it. It's kind of a foggy white. The other side had clarion. Look at the deep grooves on this thing. Picture more of the tip. You can see how it looks like glass block, doesn't it? Not really like your windshield glass in your car. And the table here is frosted. I swear it says HS star upside down, but probably something else. A couple other pictures here. Summer Clarion. Notice how like this cork is cut, cut at an angle. That's a pain. Now here's the one that I showed at the very beginning that's taller than the other ones I have. I have two of them of this length. One has a little chip on the end I have to fix. And this one, this one I actually bought off of eBay with an old silver plated metal clarinet. Um, I bought it because it had an O'Brien mouthpiece on it. I don't remember what I did with the clarinet. <laughs> but I sold it, I guess. But this mouthpiece is absolutely rivals the Chetevays from the early 1900s, easily. To mention, the beak is longer than normal and the window isn't as wide which gives it, you know, it's a volume thing. So by making that as wide a little bit longer, it maintains the same volume as when a little bit shorter and a little bit wider. Uh, there's really nothing. It's not frosted table or anything. So you see on here it says Selma. I swear it says Selma, but, you know, there's an E and an R in there. And if you look at these, you'll see that the sidewalls come down and at the very end, they bow out. And this is a common thing with some of the O'Briens. Going on with a 1955 model, uh, really nothing special here on the facing head, the size and stuff. And these all came in a tube, various tubes at various times. Here's a five model. No end cap, frosted table, larger tip. There's O'Brien on here, has the number up here that I can't read anymore. Amazing, when, you, when you're young, your eyes can read anything. When you get older, it's like, oh, I used to be able to read that. Now I have no idea what it says. So this is on the top of the mouthpiece.
different side of flutes here. Frosting on the table. Here's one with the chip on the front I have to fix. It's a 1970s model. Same visual identification, 1980s, three flutes on either side, brass end cap. The crystal is not as clear. Brian is actually on the table. In the upper left, a X4. In lower left, an OCB7 is etched. Tip opening is 1.19 millimeters, 16 millimeter facing. You know, if you look at enough of these things, they all kind of look at the same, but they're all slightly different. Keep in mind, he was using one of those electronic etchers to etch on the instrument every single time. On glass, that must, must have been a bear for each individual one. And this was a small time operation. I think they're located in Indianapolis, Indiana, if I recall. If you know for sure, put in the comments where they're located. Here's a 72 model. Etching on the table. Is that OCB star 72 is etched on it? OCB 72, O'Brien. This crystal is more clear than the older ones. It's a 1980s model. Oh, this is, I believe, the one that I bought. Um, from Woodwind and Brasswind. Hip opening 0.16 millimeters. To be scribed on the upper left table, OCB 80 on the lower left table, O'Brien scribed in the middle of the table. So here we go. O'Brien, OCB 80 down here, and 3X on the top left. So there's a variety of ways they you know mark them over the years, depending upon who did it, I guess. Notice the cork. This is compressed cork, so it's composite cork. Cork bits that are glued together and used as a cork sheet. Once again, you look at the mouthpiece. You got, you got the side walls and it bows out just before it hits the bore. And that's my rundown of O'Brien crystal mouthpieces. I hope you like it, the information I gave. If you have any more information, put it in the comments below. Don't forget to give it a share, like, and thumbs up. And we'll see you next time.